All right, we're going to continue now in our worship by uh, reflecting on uh, Ephesians chapter 3. It's a famous prayer that Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. And so uh, the the scripture will come up on the screens in a second here. And we're really going to be exploring this idea of what is a saint, as you just heard. And uh, I really think that if we receive the truth scripturally of what Uh, God thinks of us and what he uh, calls us in uh, the Bible, then we're going to find out that there are some radical identity statements that God's making about his people that if we can really absorb them, I think will really form and shape who we are. And really, I think one of the issues that we have, all of us, is some form of mixed identity. And so I have a story I want to share with you up front here. It has to do with my little son. He was the one who raised his hand and spoke about Spider-Boy this morning. He's completely obsessed with Spider-Man. I've told some of you this story before, but uh, he's so obsessed with Spider-Man, he refuses to wear any other clothing. And, um, of course, so so he gets his Spider-Man, but then he also comes here, and as you see, he also gets taught, okay, the real power comes from Jesus. So the other day, he comes to me and he says, Dad, I have to tell you a secret. And so, you know, anytime your dad and your son says, I have a secret for you, you get so excited and you're like, oh, what's he going to say? And so he he comes up and he whispers in me here. He says, I have x-ray vision. (laughs) And I was like, okay, uh, you have x-ray vision. Okay, great. How did you get x-ray vision, son? And he says, Jesus gave it to me. (laughs) And then the other day, he's just playing with his toys, and he's kind of learning about prayer, and mom does a good job praying with him at night. And so he's just playing with his toys, and he just says, dear God, this is my Spider-Man super weapon. Amen. And we're all just like, <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> well, I guess you can pray about anything, right? Um, that's what's important to him at this point, so I just want to share it with God. But it, it made me think about how, you know, even in my own life, and I think that the truth is that identity is at the center of a, a huge question for a lot of us. How much of our identity is rooted in the things we see in the Bible and in Scripture and these declarations like, you are a saint, you are God's holy people, and how much of it is rooted in something else, uh, some compartment somewhere else, something that somebody told you you were, maybe it was your parents or your family or your friends, uh, maybe there's some work-life ambition and things in your life that uh, you, you will really drives you, really drives who you are and your personhood, and you, you see that as some of the distinctives of who you are and what you're about, not that uh, some of those things are bad, but that maybe they could get in the way of your true identity and understanding who you are because of who Jesus is. And so that's what we're really driving at today with this idea of what it means to be a saint. So we're going to look at three scriptures in the New Testament and the latter epistles that are talking about saints and God's holy people. So the first one we're going to look at this morning, we're going to kind of go line by line through this prayer, and I'll read to you uh, Ephesians 3.14 says this, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So Paul, as he writes this in church history, he believes, uh, history tells us that he's probably in jail as he's kneeling, as he's saying these words and praying for this baby church that he planted in Ephesus that he's so worried about and wants to shape and form who they're going to become on this mission of God, that he's in jail, he kneels before the Father. 
and he prays for this small church. In the context of Ephesus at that time, it's, it was a main cultural hub. Uh, it was a port city, and it was a completely pagan society that worshipped the goddess Artemis. And so it was just a small baby church in this context that was totally different, had total belie- different belief system, different process and way of living than the one that Paul was trying to exhort to, this church to live into. And so he, he prays for them. And he, he, uh, he, he prays this radical prayer of strengthening. And he gives them a picture of the power of God. This power of God that is in their inner being. And I think, too, we have this framework here as we uh, do church together in a society here in Southern California in, a, in America. Actually, John Tyson has a wonderful book called The Creative Minority where he gives us a picture of, okay, we talked about Ephesus's culture. What is our culture here in America? And John Tyson's argument, he actually is an Anglican priest in New York City where it's about 5% Christian at this point. And he talks about how really uh, over the last 50 years that Christians have been moved out of the center of power in America and out onto the fringes of culture. Where once if you came to your friends and your neighbor in your workplace and you said, I'm a Christian, that would have held a certain place of power and esteem and dignity. And now that type of conversation has been cast out of the public sphere. And that, that decentralizing of the power of the Christian in public life has really caused the church to uh, have many responses to the fear of that loss, a uh, total loss of a Christian framework in our culture. And we all feel that and experience that as we leave this place, as, uh, you know, we, we enter into, and especially on the coast, what's known as post-Christian nation. That people know about God, but they, they see, it, see God and, and, and Christians as, as a threat, um, as, as uh, you know, backwards, as anti-intellectual, all of these uh, perceptions of what Christians are as a, as a threat to uh, the modern way of living. And, and the church, John Tyson says, you know, makes a couple choices in the midst of that that we, we see in and around our culture. One of them is sort of a preservation culture. It's like, uh, okay, so we've been cast out of the center of society So what our job is to huddle down together and just meet with one another and just uh, preserve, preserve, preserve these truths Uh, and and talk about them in our small circles and never really branch out, but we'll we'll just have a holy huddle and take care of it that way, just preserving these truths. Or, uh, you know, there's a fear-based response that is like, okay, we're going to fight to get back to the center. And we're going to... um, do everything we can. Uh, maybe the, cr- the culture will get more pagan and l- even more anti-Christian, and we'll just, hopefully, God will come back and save us, and th- the heck with the rest of them, and uh, we just got to fight our way into the center again, the best that we know how. But the argument from John Tyson is that he, he has a third way that I really believe is the third way and a a way forward for the church, which is to talk about becoming a creative minority, much like the church in Ephesus became. Uh, This little small church that uh, Paul prayed this radical prayer for power and strength in their inner being, and then out of that prayer, in the next couple of generations, Ephesus is actually known for the resting place of John, the, the, the revelator who wrote Revelations. That was the last place he ended up. And actually Mary, the mother of Jesus, was also buried in Ephesus. Because Ephesus, like we just sang, uh, the Christian gospel and the way of Jesus caught on like wildfire there because of this prayer and this teaching. And by the end of uh, John's life, 
Ephesus was about 90% Christian. And the Christian movement had branched out all over the place. From this creative minority came this radical movement of God. And so I think we, St. Andrews, find ourselves in this situation. So the exhortation is, what, what is a creative minority? Well, here's the definition uh, that he brings. He says, a creative minority is a Christian community in a web of stubbornly loyal relationships, knotted together in a living network of persons who are committed to practice the way of Jesus together for the renewal of the world. This is what I want us to invite each other into. This type of radical depiction of community in the way of Christ together. Doesn't take a big uh, group. It takes a committed, loving, loyal group with the power of Jesus and the ability to see themselves in the identity of Jesus and walk boldly with confidence into a world that does not always accept them. But to know that whether they're accepted or rejected by the world, that they are God's children. They are saints, a holy people, a holy community. And this was also a problem in Jesus' time, and we see uh, uh, some of the, the ways in which I think we have this list here of the Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, and Zealots. Okay, so this is when Jesus came onto the scene, right? These are the various religious sects and how they were responding to what was, uh, in their time, a, a just a, a small group of, uh, of Jews in the midst of this larger dominant culture. So this, the Sadducees, their approach was to uh, join up with the empire. And they, their, their whole goal was, we need power, prestige, and we'll really kind of bend the rules a little bit on what, what we believe in order to join up with uh, the larger dominant culture. So we need, just need to assimilate to the dominant culture. Or the Pharisees. The Pharisees is an expression we see a ton uh, in the Bible, and this is who Jesus was in conversation with the most. But th- this group really said, you know what we need to do? We need to double down on legalism. Like, we need to get a lot of our rules, because we're losing our, our identity, uh, and uh, so we just need to litigate our identity into the culture. We just make more and more rules. We, we, we strain out all of the scriptures to dissect every last possible rule, and we need to live into that as, a, as our identity. That's the way we'll preserve. Or here's the Essenes. We see this, too. This is a, a movement to just separate, to just leave the Essenes left the, the main centers of society and they went out into the wilderness and by themselves, never interacting with the larger culture. And they, they did it that way. The zealots were much more pragmatic. They were like, I, we're ready to go to war. We, we're going to fight. We're going to start a military revolution to take over uh, this dominant culture that we find ourselves in. And then Jesus comes. And he doesn't pick any of these sides. And he announces a kingdom, kingdom of heaven. And he says, this upside down kingdom that we just saw so beautifully expressed through our children and through uh, their service to the community. Talk about a public witness to go to their AYSO team, soccer team, and say, I, my church is, is caring for the homeless. Will you buy some lemonade? How's your Christian witness? Because some of our kids are doing a great job representing what this church is doing in our community. What a beautiful picture. Standing in the power of Jesus. Okay, so there's a couple expressions there, and then uh, we'll continue in our scripture to verse 15. So Paul continues his prayer, and he says, And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And you can see there, that's where the title of this series comes from. Together with 
all the saints. I think we have a picture of all the saints here somewhere. Saints together. All of God's holy people through generations and generations, but all of God's holy people here today. And no one individual person. This prayer isn't for an individual person. It's actually a prayer, you could see, for community. Because how are we going to grasp how wide and deep is the love of Christ? The only way we can do it fully is together. It's saying when we come together as God's people, then we have arms long enough to stretch wide enough to fully grasp all together the love of God. The only way we understand our identity is if we come together to stretch our arms open wide and just let Scripture inform us how good God is and how much he can change us, how much our identity is marked and shaped by him and him alone and not the changing of culture. And I I, want to use an illustration of a a time in church history that just radically... uh, a group of people, this group of 300 people, understood this and what happened. And you may know of this if you've been tracking with church for a while, but there's this incredible group of people called the Moravians. And so uh, I'm going to get some of these. These are complicated names from Australia, so I'm going to go to my notes here for this. But um, there was a group, there's a guy named here named Count Zizendorf. What a name. And Count Zizendorf was a count, and he lived in Austria. And this was a time right after the Reformation, a couple hundred years after the Reformation, where there was a lot of infighting between Catholics and Protestants. And so there was some persecution happening from the Catholic side, and so uh, Count Zizendorf had this radical, uh, he had this radical conversion with God. In fact, I think the next slide is... Uh, the seal of the community that he started. This is the Moravian seal. And he, he had this radical conversion, but he was a count, so he had a lot of money, and he had this estate. So he actually wanted to become a pastor, but he wasn't allowed to. And so he was like, what do I do? And then this persecution broke out. And so what he did is he took his estate, and he offered it up to people who were seeking uh, asylum, that were experiencing persecution. Well, there was many Protestant sects. So one of the things that the, the Catholics of the time looked at, uh, at the Protestant church and said, you know what, you guys are just going to endlessly fight, endlessly fracture. You're going to, uh, once you break off from us, all unity is gone. And, and actually, that was kind of true at the beginning of the, this break, where Count Zizendorf allowed for all these different sects. It was kind of Anabaptists and Mennonites and they all came to live on his property. And they started fighting with each other over differences in theology. And so you can imagine he had all of these people living on his property, all of whom did not like each other, and there's this massive tension going on. So Count Zizendorf decided he was going to go and knock on each person's door, each family's door, and present to them a new way of thinking. Uh, And this is what came out of that. This is the Moravian slogan. You've probably heard it before. It says, In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, love. And so he presented to them this, uh, that they should center around what they have in common. They should allow for some differences of opinions about things that do not matter, the non-essentials. And then in all things that they should have love. And after presenting that to all the households, they speak of this day they call the Moravian Pentecost, where they came together, there's this unity that started to happen by all these families choosing to kind of come together instead of separate. And so they had communion one day as a community together. And they call it the Moravian Pentecost, where just they felt this radical experience of the love of God. And out of that actually sprang a a hundred-year continuous prayer chapel where somebody from a a, a Moravian would come and they would pray and then the next Moravian would come and pray. And that went on for a hundred years through night and day, 24 hours a day. And then the other thing that happened was this 
great movement, just like that first Pentecost of missions throughout the world. Two Moravians decided that they were going to, because of how uh, catastrophically evil the slave trade was, they were going to sell themselves into slavery. And so they did, and they, they sold themselves into the Caribbean slave trade, and they went and they converted an island of a thousand slaves um, and, and, and radically transformed this island in the Caribbean. And then there's a famous guy in church history, you may have heard of him, his name's John Wesley, and he created the Methodist movement. And Wesley wasn't always a successful evangelist. In fact, he came to America and tried to convert the Indians and the people that were there. And he got totally rejected, he was completely depressed. And so the story goes that he was on his way back to England where he came from, and there was this storm in the middle of the night, and he was with some Moravians, and he was terrified and petrified, and he saw the faith of these praying Moravians, and it really left a mark on him. And so he went to this uh, meeting where uh, a Moravian was reading from Romans, and he heard the scriptures read from this authentic Christian person. And that's actually where we see where Jonathan Wesley describes his testimony of where his heart was strangely warmed. And he then started the Methodist movement, which broke out this great awakening. Well, what also took place during this time, just a few years later, was that William Wilberforce and his movement to abolish slavery in England started to catch on. And one of the, the the pushbacks from Parliament was that if, if they liberated the slave trade, that all of the slaves would riot and rebel, and that they couldn't liberate them because then they would be a massive threat. Well, uh, William Wilberforce centered in on this movement of the Moravians that converted this island of slaves and said, look, this is what happened when the gospel went forth. It didn't break out in a riot. It went to unity and transformation and so by being able to use that story, the parliament was won over, and the abolition of the slave trade was able to take place. All from this small, creative minority that in the midst of a larger culture, in the midst of persecution, was able to not flee or step back or be based in fear or preservation, worry about themselves, but to stand up and to live into this radical truth that we just read. That we are rooted and established in the love of God. That that is who you are and that is who I am. And this is the truth that can change the world. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to just practice this together. So I have a list and actually, if you want one on the way out, I did this with the deacons already, but I found it to be so powerful that I just think it could become a regular practice if you would want it. Uh, but this, this piece of paper, you don't have it yet, but you could get it in the back. It just says, my identity in Jesus. What I want you to do, saints, is I want you together to hear these truths of who God says you are in Jesus and to grasp them to grasp them together, to stretch your heart wide enough as a community to really let these things impact you. So if you need to close your eyes or if you just need to listen, hear these truths this morning. My identity in Jesus, beloved, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. My identity in Jesus, a child of God, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. My identity in Jesus delighted in. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. My identity in Jesus, forgiven. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to our sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. My identity in Jesus, washed clean. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. 
my identity in Jesus, free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. My identity in Jesus, a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? My identity in Jesus, adopted into God's family. The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. My identity in Jesus, co-heirs with Christ. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. My identity in Jesus, righteous, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. My identity in Jesus, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. My identity in Jesus, a saint, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. My identity in Jesus, set apart. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. My identity in Jesus, an ambassador of Christ. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making an appeal through us. My identity in Jesus, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. My identity in Jesus, a sweet aroma, for we are, the God, we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. My identity in Jesus, never alone. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. My identity in Jesus, a masterpiece, for you are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago. My identity in Jesus, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My identity in Jesus, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. My identity in Jesus, having guaranteed victory. You have given me your shield of victory. Your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make me great. My identity in Jesus, holding to a secure future. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. My identity in Jesus, whole in Christ. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Let's pray. Lord, help us to receive this. God, help us to know how you love us. Who you've shaped and formed us to be in this world. And get get rid of all the other stuff that gets in the way of this reality. God, make us a creative minority based in love. We thank you for the opportunity of the people next to us in these pews, Lord, and how they care and love and serve us, Lord, and in turn, may we care and love and serve the community around us in the same way. Lord, move in our hearts, move in our lives, use us, In your name we pray. Amen.